it's 11 o'clock right. and we're uh, excited this morning. We're all here in a packed house. Uh, my name's Jeremy, if you don't remember. Or don't oh, yeah. <laughs> There's another Jeremy here, too. I'm the supervisor for South Eber River and Malakoff Diggins. And uh, today I um, have been recently talking with John Olmsted, and he really wants to make sure that you know, our volunteers and our rangers have all the information that he has about the park. And John Olmsted, I want him to come in. Come on in, John. Yeah. He's, a, he's a, a naturalist and an undeveloper. So with that, uh, we're going to go about an hour and then take a break and then go a little longer. So if uh, you have to go for some reason, uh, just wave and if you introduce yourself at the break, that would be nice. Okay, well I have to take my coat off like Mr. Rogers here <laughs> and, and introduce the hat first. How many of you were here on uh, Saturday? Raise your hands. Uh, one, one, two people that are absolutely thrilled that they were there, right? And this is a very sacred feather. Do you know what that feather might be? Yes. Salmon? No. Well, yeah, that's the, that's the salmon. salmon's blood on it. Yeah. So this is one of the 28 feathers, or 27 or 28 runners who, yes, the runners who, ran across who is this. actually starting to help the Uber River State Park by forming with Sean Garvey and 25 conservationists from the Bay Area a lower Yuba stewardship uh, near to um, about 500 acres of state park land that's hard to uh, manage among all the thousands and millions of acres in the state park system. John, can you back up into the light? Yes. Um. No, no, just stay where you are, just back up that way. Oh, okay. Remember how we set it up? Okay, well, so anyway, that's the feather that came from the coast. This hat was at the coast. The feathers in the hat fell out that morning and said there's a new feather to go in here today. And so when I got there, Eric Hitchcock uh, said, here, this feather, feather's for you. <laughs> so we'll, the whole salmon ceremony is a separate subject, but we'll mention it briefly. So I'm so thrilled to be here today, and I'm blessed with a handmade shirt for Mr. Moen of Moen Solinsky Gallery, which didn't quite fit him. <laughs> it's my Western artist shirt. And my hair is not, not as long as when I teach about John Muir, so that I'm not in John Muir garb, but we have a John Muir, John Muir specialist with us here, who we may ask a question or two during the morning. And um, I'm a John Muir generalist, hmm. and John Muir is very much in uh, our minds if we've been watching the National Park series on PBS. How many of you watched that? Yeah. See? All 12 hours. <laughs> Did you tape it? And, and you notice how they began each session almost. John Mueller was in many sessions. And I think that's because uh, somewhere among the, the wonderful things here, which we'll find during the day, is the, the picture of John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt. So that symbolizes what we think of John Muir as being. And I now realize it's out in the car, but I have a John Muir quarter. Have all of you seen the John Muir quarter? California. I'll show you that at intermission. But uh, if you had to give one thing that John Muir is the father of, what would you say? National National Park. Yosemite. Yosemite. The idea. Conservation. The idea. Yes. Because, because the national parks <laughs> exist in a historical context of the conservation movement that was emerging and began with Yosemite State Park. <laughs> Not an official national park. Hmm. But as Bonnie Geisel, who organized the John Muir Conference a few years ago, pointed out, um, that's only because Yellowstone didn't have a governor. <laughs> And so they had to invent the national parks because Yellowstone was a territory and there wasn't anybody to take care of it. So you can think of Yosemite as the first national park because it was created during the Civil War by the genius of uh, T. 
two uh, relatively wealthy persons. The congressman's going to be wealthy, the young congressman Kanes, and Israel Raymond, the head of the, the ships, the shipping on the west coast. And then little glimmerings of what was happening with Frederick Law Olmsted and Central Park before he was the Sanitary Commission uh, Secretary for Lincoln during the Civil War. But that is why uh, he was said by President Lincoln to ask the governor of California to put him at the head of the commission for the first Yosemite Park commissioner because he had, over squabbling in the sanitary commission, he had left to try to recoup his fortunes and lost them again by coming to work for John Fremont's mind, which had been high graded. So there's the next historic context where all of this is taking place in the context of the gold rush. What John Muir finds in California is all up to where the gold was, so he never really explored the Yuba River much because it was so total, the, the middle and lower parts were so ravished by the gold mining. Mm. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. So today I'd like to have us go back as the National Park Series did to something about the origin of the California state parks just in the we, we will talk about the state parks without going into the depths that I don't know yet, um, but I'm, I'm learning about them. But we will talk about how the formation of the national parks works into it and how John Muir works into that. So I think many of you have... Uh, do you have that John Muir book that you have yes. to bring with you? Still out in the car. Um, you know, I'll bring it to you here. Yeah. Thank you very much. We we were together at a key moment in night in 2001 at a John Muir conference, and uh, there are two national parks books which are on the table here, and there is one John Muir book which which has uh, everything in one book and it's really valuable to be able to have it a national park uh, growth coming about because of John Muir's worldwide journey. So I want to get us the world context that John Muir lived in and of course John Muir isn't, there are several founders of the national parks, we can, we can talk about him and Frederick Law Olmsted, but the first parks director, Stephen Mather, is important, and the editor of the Century Magazine is important. So John Muir didn't get to do his travels here until a 40-year detour uh, in his life. And so I'd like to go over his life a little bit, and I'll refer to this <laughs> periodically. I'll take up a very poor John Muir brogue periodically. <laughs> If we had Frank Helling here or Lee Stetson, you know, they would give us a really wonderful presentation. But we can all do it a little bit. I uh, have a maternal uh, grandfather who was a hay, and John Muir had a maternal grandmother who was a hay. So somewhere way back there, there is some connection eventually. <laughs> um, at the time that John Muir is born in Scotland, I have to do this quickly like I do a talking John Muir blues. You know, he was he was aimed at his studies like a, a charger aimed at, at, for war, you know, by his teachers who never spared to the rod. And he, he, learning was by rote, but the learning for John, Johnny Muir was the scooters on the rooftops and the bird's nests out in the Glen. But at the age of 11, from Dunbar, Scotland, which is a, a shipping place, Dunbar, Scotland is east on the Firth of Forth. It's where all the ships come by around the world. In 1838, when he's born, and into the 1840s, the ships to explore Africa and South America and to get commerce are coming and going. And this is so much in his mind that he's 
got a view of the entire world that the world is, is all one for John Muir. The places that he wants to go, uh, if we put ourselves in the, uh, the eye, I wanted to be the man who followed in Mungo Park's footsteps and explored down the whole Niger River when his life was cut off on a second trip. Because he discovered the, the headwaters and went to Timbuktu. And then on the second trip he was killed because he didn't have enough trade goods. He wasn't wealthy enough an explorer. The model of a wealthy explorer is Alexander von Humboldt, mm. who John Newton also read about. His mother said, you could, you could be a Humboldt or a Mungo Park. And then he went off to America. Bairns, we gang America tomorrow. <laughs> In one day, pack your things, say goodbye to your schoolmates, and off across the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean uh, with other people seasick and your face up in the wind on the bowsprit, you know, just like a predecessor of the windstorm in the forest on the ridge up here. Now, most of you have read the story of the windstorm on the forest, but you don't realize that Muir says, uh, I was meeting a lady friend, Mrs. Pelton, in Brownsville, and a big storm was coming up. It was sort of preceded by a big windstorm. And I just had to be out to observe the windstorm, and I didn't take my coat. And when she said, oh, Johnny, take your coat, I, s I realized she was not for me. <laughs> <laughs> and so the account of, of climbing the tree, uh, looking out over the forests as if the wind is sweeping through the forests as uh, the wind at the prairies of Mendocino through the grass, and the trees were the grass. And the, the ripples in the forest, like ripples in uh, the grass where Andrew Wyeth paints Christina, imagine his an analogical uh, ima imagery mind who had this worldview of the origins of rivers in the center of Africa, the origins of rivers in the center of South America, uh, which has to do with the fact that we'll skip through his life briefly here in Wisconsin, where he puts his eye out with a sharp file after being a genius in his basement, escaping his father's 14 hour a day farm work at midnight, waking up, getting three hours of sleep like Edison, waking up, and if it's too cold, he whittles the parts of clocks with his uh, expert whittling. And, and he has a, a barn where he works as part of 14 hours a day, a well where he almost dies at the bottom. And these are the um, inventions where, like, he makes incredibly exquisite clocks. It's as if, in, if we have formal lifetimes, he had a former lifetime as a Swiss clockmaker <laughs> because he, he has little wheels running all the way down the side. This is a side. The little wheels go down to the pendulum at the end, and the pendulum goes back and forth, and every little wheel exactly meticulously works to run this and actually have it function like a clock. Now that side clock was taken to the World's Fair not the World's Fair, the County Fair, when he was 21, escaping his uh, religious, over-religious father at last, having only studied when people gave him books in the basement, and never having gone to high school. And so his, this is one of his inventions, goes to that, this is the chair that you sit in and a gun goes off. <laughs> and there are many others. But his inventions were recognized by Mrs. Carr, the wife of the chemistry professor at the University of Wisconsin, if I have that correct. And she got him a $5 prize. You know, he had $20, $20 gold piece, I think, that his grandfather gave him. His father never gave him anything for those 
uh, 11 years of slavery on the farm. And so he was this genius who could make machinery in the basement, and he actually made a sawmill and didn't patent it. He gave it to the lumber company to use to cut up trees faster and rail against the Sierra Club he would one day found, which wanted them to cut down trees slower. <laughs> so, so, well, anyway, there he is, a loose upon the University of Wisconsin, and he, he discovers botany, and Mr. Griswold uh, alerts him to the similarity of, of a locust tree to a, a sweet pea and some beans in the garden. And that gives him the direction to be a Ferdinand the Bull when the Civil War marchers are down in the square at the university. He hears the drumbeats of war and he, like Ferdinand the Bull, goes off to collect flowers in Canada. <laughs> um, so it's, it, it's nothing new. But his way to make money, to be a conventional person in the 1860s, everybody worked. There wasn't any shirking of work. Everybody must raise, you know, must earn their keep. So his inventive skills got him into a broomstick factory. So he was in the industrial uh, revolution and uh, his broomstick factory was very effective with machinery he designed, having learned through clocks, and yet it burned down. And somewhere in his life there he said, uh, sometimes uh, God or Mother Nature has to make us do what is wanted. <laughs> uh, and of course the second major accident is he is working in a Supplier of parts, I believe, to Studebaker Carriage Company, which got a start with wheelbarrows in the gold rush and then is in Indianapolis and the supplier that he's working for, he invents the eight-hour day to tell, tell the, um, the empl his employers that if they, he makes a graph of the work throughout a day like an industrial um, not an industrial engineer, but an industrial efficiency designer. And he, the graph of the day's work goes, uh, uh, starts very slowly when it's five o'clock in the morning, and then it goes up, and then when it, about eight o'clock in the morning, it's light and sunny and everybody, and the work goes along here, and there's some little blips for when the supervisor comes by, and then <laughs> there's some more blips. Uh, for, for, for lunch there's a downturn and then you're a little sleepy after lunch and it starts up and it runs across here and then it goes down for two hours over here. So he said, look, you just pay him for, you're paying him by the hour, so just pay them for eight hours. So for the reason of the, uh, to make it into the interest of the owner rather than the interest of the worker. He's an inventor of the eight hour day and then he doesn't follow it as Frank <laughs> Elling tells in his John Muir story. Um, I, I'd invented the eight-hour day and it didn't follow my own advice. I was working at nine o'clock at night, taking apart a leather belt, and there's one vision that he would be plying the belt with a, I could be plying the belt with a sharp file, or we could have had the, the file go into the turning wheel and whiz up, and, and my right eye comes out and flew it in my hand, and <coughs> staggers home. And in the darkness and the gloom of that uh, gloomy old room, he says, if I ever see again, I will study not the inventions of men, but the inventions of God. So he goes off across in his great walk to Florida, because he's going to the Amazon. So here we are on our map of, of um, and we've got to zoom in on this. So here we've walked from... Uh, Louisville, just south of Indianapolis, down to Florida. It's a little red line that's part of it's the Appalachian Trail today. And he walks from the east coast of the narrow spot of Florida to the west on an old railroad. It was actually a new, freshly new railroad for the Civil War to get uh, communication between the, the Gulf and the Atlantic. And by then, he has watched, again, as Frank Helling says, he has watched out for alligators, but not mosquitoes. And, and the more he walks, he's walking slower and slower, up slower on that railroad right of way till he gets to the, 
the Florida to the uh, Gulf Coast, and he's dying of malaria. And the family there that nurses him back to life uh, suggests that if he wants to go to the Amazon, he won't. He'll catch his malaria again. But uh, and this is Bonnie Geisel's thought that he is in Cuba, having earned enough money to go to have about forty dollars for a ship steerage fare, and he's in Cuba curing up down here, and. The first ship, if it takes him to the Amazon, he would have died of tropical diseases within five or ten years probably, especially with no money. Uh, because he says this f famous words are, um, I could have been a millionaire, but I chose to become a Trump. <laughs> and, and that's in reference to the great guilt of uh, carrying a plant press down the Appalachian Mountains and sleeping in cemeteries instead of to a, a man's, a, a good man's work. That's a good break for us here. Mm -hmm. So, here, here is Johnny Muir, and we're zooming in again on him in Cuba. And he is still sick. He's walking up and down the glorious tropical beaches um, and, you know, being really thrilled about the tropical botany and knows about Yosemite because it's been in the national papers ever since it was set aside in 1864 by President Lincoln. And it's been in the national magazines. The predecessor of Century Magazine is Scribner's Magazine. So he knows about it, probably, through also Mrs. Carr. And the letters are very hard to get back and forth months apart here. But the first ship doesn't take him to Venezuela to be Alexander von Humboldt's uh, prover of the Orinoco River and the Amazon. He wants to, he's read about the connection, so he wants to go to that connection, the, the center of the continent. And I neglect to say, he is fathered by chance chose to live at the center point of the North American continent where the voyagers from France, the fur traders, actually transferred from St. Lawrence system to the Mississippi. So John Muir grows for 11 years at Portage, Wisconsin. So he, he's got this big vision of the world that we don't even have our kids in school learning geography anymore. And it's that vision that says to him, I'm going to take the first ship to Venezuela, to the Orinoco River, the Amazon, or this, I'll take a one-year detour in Yosemite. And it's that detour, thanks to the National Parks, the beneficiary of the fact that detour became 42 years, and he gets back to the Amazon when he's it's, it's about 73 or 74 years old. And so that's this trip down here and over to here. So, the, he, you know, that, that was his South American, African dream that waited while he became the father of preserving part of the mountains of North America. So you, we need to put John Muir in the context of Audubon as preserving the birds of America through his art, through illustrating things like the passenger pigeon, which would then go extinct, and in a day uh, when photo photography was just beginning. And then after Audubon, we get John Muir working, say, 30 years preserving the mountains of North America. And then, at the end of that, in 1899, John Muir goes to the Alaskan Harriman Expedition, which is up here. And they aren't, for some reason, showing that very well. But in 1899, he goes by ship all the way around the edge of Alaska and up here. And the photographer would photograph uh, John Muir and John um, another famous John naturalist, John Burroughs, that photographer begins 30 years of photographing the Indians of North America at the end of their lives. And I didn't bring an Edward Curtis book. So you have Audubon, John Muir, and Edward Curtis all giving their lives to North American uh, natural features and, and native cultures. And what was here as a great Eden when the Columbus Comet burst upon the New World with all of its adverse effects. And 
as I came in the door today with this feather in my hat, you are seeing the park here, and of course we're just going to go all the way around. We're not going to talk about Bridgeport directly uh, until we will next week, but the context, every, every park has to have exist in a historic context of what's going on in the world that induce the people who are helping to make that park see it, the need for it. We can have something somewhat local like Empire Mine and a wonderful realtor and people like Bob Payne who have helped make Malakoff Park and, and the historic district in Nevada City. But if you look into Bob Payne's life, you find that, you know, although his biography is a little bit fanciful, that he goes back to Anthony Wayne in the, or Ant, I don't know, somebody, not Anthony Wayne, he goes back to a general in the Revolutionary War and his life represents the pioneering across America. And Frederick Law Olmsted uh, was born of a family that came in 1633 to Connecticut and uh, then that family was part of the burning up of 500 Pequot Indians in a cast in a their their uh, wonderful stockade, their beautiful safe stockade. But but the uh, Americans burned up all the men, women, and children, and then had a Thanksgiving proclamation <laughs> in, in thanking God for uh, now having the land. So this feather connects. This wonderful state park that is so wonderful because of all of the elements of a state park system that's as large, really the 34th largest park system in the world, its vast resources and then the wonderful volunteer resources of the Cooperating Association and the 2,000 volunteers who helped buy and start the Jug Handle Park which gave the money as part of the down payment on the first acquisition of this park. We have just an incredible history of park preservation that brings us to then be the hosts for the Bring Back the Salmon ceremony for four years in a row. So if you're not all familiar with that, starting four years ago, the native Maidu tribe who were, their federal status I heard yesterday, I don't know if it's true, was taken away in 1940 or 50 because they didn't have any land, which is for the wrong reasons to take it away. I mean, without the status, how could they get back any land? They don't need, if, if you give them 20 acres of land right now, they may not be able to accept it because they can't raise the money for the taxes. Um, but this feather was found on the Pacific Ocean by special people. It was put on willow poles cut by school kids in Smartsville, I believe, which were then brought up here and maybe sticking in the sand down there and they can sprout. <laughs> So the, but the, that's symbolic that the salmon, which were carried for uh, last year, a 30-pound salmon was carried, was speared with fishing game permission by Native American harpoon designs from Grayson Coney and brought up here and came up by boat up Englebright and then ran on the Point Defiance Trail and then brought across the river um, when photography ceases and a ceremony held with the uh, permission of the State Parks Department and in all of the resources that all of you have put together here that this was the biggest year uh, and there were grand, great, great, great grandchildren here this weekend of Pocahontas, Chief Seattle, Chief Black Elk, Chief Crazy Horse, uh, Red Cloud, whoever, they were all here and it was one of the biggest gatherings of Native Americans in, in um, of North American indigenous people in, 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 as an alternate to the Columbus Comet. So people that are wide awake to what's happening in the world realize that when they talk about Columbus Day now, there's a very powerful indigenous people's day or indigenous people's weekend or four days at Nevada City that is the gathering movement for restoring the honor and culture of the Native Americans who were probably wiped out faster and in greater percentages here than anywhere else through the, the gold rush. And so the Maidu tribe is flourishing and what happened this weekend is a 
worldwide importance, and this feather I carry with great honor. And you, as a Bridgeport volunteer, uh, are, are, I hope, very honored to have actually uh, made this place where all these people could gather and be part of this uh, peacemaking and restoration of the wholeness of North America, which is where these ideas began. Now, I have one old-fashioned thing here. It came out of the estate of a very wonderful man, and it's you know just a middle-aged pocket watch. But we are uh, blessed at this place that a series of events happened that I can just flash through. Let's get this phone uncovered. What is it? Want some water, John? Yeah, I'd love it. Want some water. We can slip in a commercial there. <laughs> well, the commercial I would slip in is that uh, now that in the in the days of straightened budgets, volunteerism at Bridgeport is all the more important, as I'm sure you all know. Um, thank you very much. I um, okay. Actually, I, I have an anti-cancer diet, and I try not to drink benzene from the. You want to just you want to compensate? Yeah, I'd like some tap water and just leave it sitting for five minutes so the chlorine can evaporate out. <laughs> Um, how am I a naturalist and how do I fit into this? Well, it's part of the John Muir story because I was born in 1938 and John Muir was born in 1838. And I realized this when I uh, went away to a mountain from a PhD through health problems and discovered that I could read Darwin that's what I was supposed to do for my PhD in a mountain cabin and be there to listen to President Kennedy uh, be the, the great whale that went around the world of his death and realize that while I could be a PhD like my father and teach botany in a college, I wouldn't do as much for the American Earth um, what I could do for it rather than what it could do for me because my family it had the American Earth to do a lot. I'm from a different branch than Frederick Law Homestead that split off just the year before they left for America. And my immediate four or five ancestors, uh, one had a flour mill under Niagara Falls. Uh, his son had gold stamp mills at Georgetown, Colorado, and sort of started the cement industry in Colton, California. And his son made work with Tesla on the first long distance power line and first power plant with that in Telluride. And then by the time he was 28 years old, had uh, helped build and was in, sort of in charge of one of the power plants at Provo and Logan, Utah, when his son was about to be born and he uh, died of tuberculosis. Um, my father was going to be an oil administrator, but the oil job stopped a year before the depression, the, the Black Friday of the Depression, and he became a history professor instead, and worked his life for the University of Outdoor Cal or of California. And I, somehow, with training in plant ecology and geology, I and then botany, I became a interested in a University of Outdoor California because the California schools were not teaching um, anything but Ottoman birds from the East Coast. There was nothing, no California ecology was in the California state texts. There were things about the missions, um, you know, but, but California ecology wasn't there. And so I realized in the mountain cabin in the aftermath of the November 22nd, 1963, that rather than go back for a PhD to uh, Cal Poly and Pomona to be near my mountain cabin, 
that I would take the job that my aunt had found for me at the Striving Arboretum in Golden Gate Park. So I became the first paid naturalist in Golden Gate Park. And that uh, job led to a set of color slides, which is in a few state parks and a lot of colleges. The color slide set got me the job uh, first with a landscape architect in the Wilderness Conference of 1967. And suddenly I was, tell, I was the exhibits chairman telling David Brower and Ansel Adams where to put up their photographs in the halls of the Hilton Hotel. And, and I'd already had a uh, Frank Capra kind of uh, relation with a streetcar in San Francisco. His got him into the movie business by, by having a dime left in his pocket and being kicked out of his hotel and going onto the streetcar and uh, the oper streetcar operator said, look, and he looked in the newspaper and it said, uh, Jewish gymnasium in Golden Gate Park turned into new angled movie studio. And he talked his way into his, his lifetime in movies that way. I went on a streetcar home from from Powell Street down at Market Street one night and chased it for two out two miles to get the last uh, end Judah streetcar to where I lived in a boarding house next to Golden Gate Park and where I met a woman in a wheelchair at the Millbury Union of the University of San Francisco and or the, the UC San Francisco Medical Center and you see these linkages go all the way through my my grandfather, maternal grandfather, was a developer. He was a realist, realtor of the movie stars. I would eventually, through extra inheritance from him, actually live for a couple of years in the beach cottage of Frederick March at South Laguna <laughs> and not realize that my grandfather, the developer, uh, was part of the problem <laughs> that I would, in the rest of my life, end up trying to undo certain aspects of it. And the reason is that you could say there is uh, construction and there is conservation, and when they come together, then there isn't just mindless destruction. And this is what Frederick Law Olmsted realized when he not only made parks, but he made park-like subdivisions. Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. helped make the, the incredible subdivision um, at Palos Verdes. And Frederick Olmsted Sr. made one outside of Chicago. And they took the idea that you're going to develop something and construct housing to go along with constructing remnants of the natural world in which we all found our um, beginnings to be part of our unnatural life in cities. And as Frederick Olmsted wrote, the Central Park is a great artwork of the democracy, of the republic. And it is that attitude that working on city parks around America, he and his son and stepson nephew, you can think in your mind of uh, he and Muir as fathers of the national parks in that sense. But it came out of that, that whirl of um, you know, destruct, the destructive westward movement and the recognition that it wasn't endless in the, the parks movements beginning almost identical with the gold rush. You get the gold rush on the west coast and the people that are going to say we need a central park are already in 1848 writing up articles, New York needs a big park. And so we are all brought up in the context of what's happening in our lives and this park has come down to us instead of an RV park across the street in a, in a hotel here hotel, motel, because of an impossible series of events, one on top of the other, that all have something that leads to it. And I can't tell you the whole story, I've given you a glimpse, but I'd like to take a break and then uh, talk somewhat about um, the carry on this idea of the, the state park system talks something about it. So we've, we've talked something about the context of national parks and the 
some of the founders. I should not be leaving out a major person, and his name is a state me, Steve Pauley, yeah. who is the editor of Century Magazine who got Muir to write um, the articles. Robert Underwood Johnson. Johnson. Yeah, Robert Underwood Johnson. Okay, so Robert Underwood Johnson is a co-father or father of Yosemite National Park because he had the wisdom to see that his Century Magazine had the uh, you know, the national ear. He was at a national pulpit and he wrote to both Frederick Law Olmsted and John Muir, which sort of recognized their founders of conservation role. He wrote to both of them and said, I want articles because I hear from Mr. Muir that the uh, hoofed locusts are <laughs> turning Tuolumne Meadows into a, you know, into a bunch of muddy hoof pants. And so Muir answered his uh, query and uh, his appeal with two wonderful articles and Frederick Olmsted was at towards the end of his life and said I just can't do it I don't have enough time because he's designing Stanford University campus he's uh, ready to design the Chicago World's Fair and he's hung up in the Biltmore estate which has a role in the the origin of the National Forest, which John Muir also wrote a lot about the National Forest System. He's really, John Muir is as, as important to the National Forest System as is uh, the, to the National Parks in a way, and so is Frederick Olmsted because he taught Biltmore, I mean Vanderbilt, to into buying a whole slew of sort of wasted former um, land whose soils were gone to make an arboretum and that is now Pisgah National Forest and they hired Gifford Pinchot mm. to be the the forester who had studied forestry in Germany and so it's it's these threads of things that go on at one place in history and then they keep getting bigger and bigger and it's the way that species form in, in Darwinian evolution to some extent that things that are different species of one genus, if you leap ahead far enough, they're the beginnings of whole families of different plants. And that way, we, we exist here today in Bridgeport in the context of what was happening uh, between 1864 and when John Muir died, say, in 1914. But we'll take a break. Okay.